Mask requirements in public schools are being lifted in various states, including North Carolina. And bomb threats continue to worry the nation's historically black colleges. Those stories plus, the Student Government Association gives us their legislative update. I'm Jay Locklear. And I'm Jay Coley. Welcome back to another episode of Carolina News Today. Governor Cooper announced new recommendations for wearing masks in schools last week, even as state lawmakers were preparing a new bill to allow students to opt out. The state's Department of Health and Human Services advised the governor that COVID-19 metrics are moving in the right direction. His new recommendations urge local school boards to consider voluntary masking, but to support students and staff who still choose to wear one. However, the General Assembly has sent to Cooper's desk a bill that would allow parents to make the decisions and would prohibit local school boards from superseding state law. It also protects schools from liability surrounding masks. States across the country are rolling back masks and vaccination mandates as COVID cases and hospitalizations continue to fall nationwide. But as more school districts drop indoor mask mandates, Dr. Anthony Fauci says relaxing restrictions so quickly could be a risky move. CNN's Camilla Burnell has the latest. Living with the virus, turning the page, endemic. I'm tired of it. I'm tired. I think I'm COVID tired. The fatigue is real. No matter what you call it, many wanting to move on. Just kind of feels exhausting and um, very tiring. It's over. Let's move on. This week, more Democrat-run states moving to end mask mandates. New Mexico announcing an immediate end to its indoor mask mandate. Washington State, too, but starting March 21st. We will no longer have a state mandate for wearing masks in indoor spaces. We think that's a very important step in the next part of our journey to normalcy. North Carolina's governor encouraging local governments and schools to end mask mandates. Now we take a positive step on mask requirements to help us move safely toward a more normal day-to-day -day life. And California's governor Gavin Newsom focusing on the next phase of living with the virus. We have all come to understand what was not understood at the beginning of this crisis, that there is no end date, that there is not a moment where we declare victory. Newsom's plan includes the ability and resources to continue testing and vaccinating and the expansion of school-based vaccine sites. Local governments can impose their own mandates, but the state's mask mandate for indoor businesses expired this week. Opinions and emotions on this still high and you feel more comfortable you should wear your mask wear the mask and if you don't want to you don't don't wear it a lot of people have gone sick a lot of people have died we could have done a lot of things better but at this point i feel like we should still kind of be trying our best dr anthony fauci saying that getting rid of masks is risky and there's another concern the omicron subvariant ba2 one preprint lab study showing it may spread faster and may cause more severe disease. The good news is, though, we're not seeing much BA2 in the United States at all. Instead, COVID hospitalizations have dropped to near pre-Omicron levels, a welcome sign for the future. If we're going to live with this thing, let's live with it as safely as we possibly can. The Student Government Association here at UNCP plans to give Carolina News Today monthly updates on their legislative agenda to hoping to keep students well versed on the issues. Here's SGA Government Operations Chair Whitney Pick. This month SGA passed its Course Evaluation Act, which acts as an alternative to rate my professor by providing more accurate information regarding courses, professors, and student performance. We also have a Single Occupancy Bathroom Act that requests the university to change single-use, gender-segregated bathrooms to become single-occupancy family restrooms. We have also introduced the Mental Health Encouragement Act to encourage the university to partake in a week of mental health awareness initiatives. In current news, SGA elections are well on their way. 
Every election as government operations chair, I have the ability to appoint four members for an electoral commission to verify upcoming candidates and to make sure everything is efficient during elections. On February 10th, SGA approved three voting members and one liaison that will act as a non-voting member to the electoral commission. Also on February 10th, SGA had a guest sp speaker, Dr. Kumala, who came to inform the Senate about future plans to bring back study abroad and have students get the opportunity to work, go to school abroad, and open up opportunities even after they graduate. We also had a guest speaker, Jillian Narenberg, from the Career Center, who presented about the JCP suit-up event. SGA approved and allocated $1,000 to the Career Center for this event. These gift cards will be used to provide students help to purchase business wear. In other news, our public relations team has updated our social media, so make sure to follow us at UNCP underscore SGA. SGA hosted a Valentine's Day event where we gave roses out to the student body and collected data regarding students and their well-being so far in the semester. On Monday, February 21st, our applications for the Fall 2020 elections opened, which will conclude on March 6th. We look forward to seeing all the new senators in our Senate next semester. SGA will host a week of events for the student body to not only celebrate SGA's accomplishments, but to recognize the student body in helping us make those changes. SGA week is from February 28th to March 4th. Find Student Government Association on Brave Connect and don't forget to RSVP to our events. There's been lots of talk on campus about the new School of Business building known as Thomas Hall. As promised, CNT reporter Josh Baker gives us an insider's look at this $36 million project. After more than five years of planning and construction, the new James A. Thomas School of Business is finally open for the spring 2022 semester. Facing out to North Odom Street, the new building acts as a crown jewel for the university. The building is open to all UNCP students, and its construction and planning set campus records for cost, requiring an estimated $38 million to build, with $7 million coming from the building's namesake, the Thomas family. This is the Stock Trading Lab, where finance students can get real experience with the stock market. The building features great views of the campus from ground level and its second floor. There's one more unique facet of the building, study rooms located all throughout the halls. It, they, they really do enjoy the space. We see uh, we have something new called uh, study rooms and kind of an experiment to see how well that works, but they're full all the time. Uh, we have to chase students out at nine o'clock when we have to, have to finally close them down. So it, it's a good place for them to gather, to get together, to meet. They have the technology in, the, in these rooms and, and so they're able to do that. The building also features a large conference hall alongside a cafe called Eat Cafe and Bites with a wide range of meal and snack options, as well as plenty of seating. The new building will also bring prosperity to the Robinson County region, thanks to its partnership with the Thomas Family Center for Entrepreneurship. Last week, MLK Week was observed at UNCP because programming got pushed back during a surge in COVID cases. The Office of Student Inclusion and Diversity hosted various events that recognized the accomplishments of Dr. King. The theme of this year's observance was empowering through community engagement. I was able to attend an event that did just that. Community and Civic Engagement in partnership with Student Inclusion and Diversity hosted a program on Wednesday entitled Poetic Justice, The Black Experience. Students filled the UC Annex to take part in this MLK Week event. Cookies and hot chocolate were served and once the lights turned off, the show began. This program was created to illustrate African-American experiences and racial injustice through song, poems, and spoken word. Students, faculty, and staff were invited to participate. Student leader Michaela Brady says, once the first participant finished, others became excited to perform. At first, people were a little nervous, but then um, after the first performance, kind of broke the ice for everybody, and then they started, I feel like they started enjoying it, warming it up to uh, the performances. Michaela also says that having this program for students has been a major goal for her this school year. I've been planning this for months. Since I got hired at CCE last semester, I had this idea. I knew I wanted to do it during Black History Month, something important, something significant. After watching the performances, one student says this event allowed her to see from others' perspectives. I felt empowered, especially after listening to like all their stories. It was very interesting to me. 
Once the event was over, students were encouraged to write their thoughts on how to tackle racial injustice. This part of the program was a passive form of expression for students. There are still opportunities to participate in other black history programs such as this one. All you have to do is go to uncp.edu forward slash brave connect. I'm Jayla Coley reporting for Carolina News Today. Two HBCUs received bomb threats last week with one being a little close to home. Fayetteville State University canceled classes Wednesday after the threat was reported. The university told residential students to shelter in place. Community students and staff were told to leave campus. Winston-Salem State University received a bomb threat that same day. The FBI says it's unclear whether these incidents are related to bomb threats that other historically black colleges and universities have received this month, which is Black History Month. Anyone with information is asked to notify campus police or call the FBI. A bridge collapse ruins a North Carolina town's signature look. And a wild animal is reunited with its owners in a Raleigh neighborhood. Plus, friends and family gather in Charlotte to remember the life of former Miss USA. You'll get those stories when we return. Listen, you're my friend. I noticed you haven't really been yourself recently. Yeah, I feel like something's up. How are you? Are you okay? Is there anything you want to talk about? I just want to know how you're feeling. And listen, even if you don't know what to say, I'm here to talk. No matter what you're going through, I just want you to know I'm here. I've got your back. When you want to talk, I'm here. A COVID-19 pill from the Merck Pharmaceutical Company appears to be helping people stay out of the hospital. A new study from India says the antiviral treatment known as Molnupiravir reduced the risk of hospitalization by 65%. Researchers looked at more than 1,200 people with COVID-19 and found that only 1.5% of the group that took the pill had to go to the hospital. That's compared to the 4.3% of those who didn't get treated with the pill. The study was presented at a major virus and infection conference, but it should be noted that the study has not yet been peer-reviewed. An iconic pedestrian bridge collapsed overnight on Friday. The bridge's wooden arches were a key part of Hickory City Walk redevelopment. What was meant to be an icon is now an eyesore. David Faraday of WSOC reports. They were the iconic arches, the centerpiece of the Hickory City Walk. But around midnight, the 40-ton arches came down onto Main Avenue Northeast. I feel like this is what represents Hickory, and it's embarrassing. Uh, and what a waste of money, $750,000, just firewood now. By daybreak, dozens of people had come out to see what was left of the pedestrian bridge that crosses Highway 127. Mayor Hank Gass spoke with us by phone saying, fortunately, no one was hurt, and that the arches that went up last year are still under warranty. Extremely disappointed. This was the iconic structure that, that really highlighted our city walk. All the engineers, all the professionals, all the architects, everyone agreed that this structure was safe and sound. The mayor says the arches were manufactured by Oregon-based company Western Wood Structures. They cost roughly $750,000, accounting for about 5% of the total $14.3 million contract the city awarded to Neil Grading and Construction Company for the city walk. The city says they were built to withstand 100 mile per hour wind gust. Channel 9 has made record requests after the project was delayed for months last spring after workers heard loud popping noises when they attempted to raise the second arch. Sarah Talbert visits the city walk with her dog every day and says she'll miss the huge arches. I walk across every day, sometimes twice a day, and it's just sad to see it a pile of rubble right now. Hickory's mayor says the city hasn't made a decision about whether the arches should be rebuilt. He thinks they should consider other options for the pedestrian bridge. There was a public memorial on Friday in Charlotte in honor of former Miss USA Chesley Christ. Chris took her own life at the end of January in New York where she was living. Friday's celebration of life was held in the 30-year-old attorney's hometown. Christ was crowned Miss USA in 2019. 
She was also a track and field star at the University of South Carolina. Three different organizations have established a scholarship or fund in Krista's honor. An exotic pet is back at home after escaping from its owner in Raleigh. What's even more strange is not the first exotic pet to escape in the area recently. Aaron Thomas of WRAL spoke to the owners. In North Carolina, there are some animals you wouldn't expect to see as pets, like this white-nosed quaddy. Kaylee Duke. And I'm Camden Willer. These two, the proud owners of Ryuk. He's about three, three and a half at this point. We've had him since he was five weeks old. With a distinct nose, sharp nails, and surprisingly strong tail, he prowled around and got loose near New Bern Avenue in Raleigh. Where is he? You know, what do we do? Yeah, why is he out? Just absolute panic. He was finally found at an exotic animal care hospital. Related to raccoons, and but they're basically from Central South America. Dr. Tara Harrison from NC State's College of Veterinary Medicine describes quaddies as active animals that love to climb. And yes, they are legal to own. To own an exotic animal in North Carolina, you can own anything that's not native. So quite a money's not needed. Ryuk's appearance comes as city leaders in Raleigh determine what wild animals residents can own. This after a venomous zebra cobra escaped a Raleigh neighborhood in the summer of 2021. And in Orange County, a pack of hybrid wolf dogs escaped their enclosure. Animal experts say quaddies aren't used to being pets, but with the loving owners. He loves to give kisses. These two insist Ryuk and their other quaddie, Kuma, are in good hands. He has a really big enclosure outside with all kinds of stuff to climb on and mm -hmm. we let him out. We have uh, dogs too and they actually all get along and play together. Yeah. Aaron Thomas, WREL News, Raleigh. The North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality hopes to award nearly $5 million in grants to make more electric vehicle charging stations available. The grants are intended to increase the use of zero emission vehicles on priority corridors such as interstates. Fast charging stations would help reduce range anxiety of drivers who have to research where their next charge is coming from. One of the priority corridors is I-74 between Asheville and Wilmington. Grant applications from existing providers are due May 16th. Coming up in CNT Sports, baseball was looking to stop a two-game losing streak as they head into the weekend. And Brace point guard Tyrell Kirk turns a tragic loss into motivation for his senior citizen season. Stay tuned. What's up, Brave Nation? I'm Deshaun Donald. Braves indoor track and field got off to a good start at the Conference Carolinas Championship in Winston-Salem over the weekend. Joshua Chepskirt dropped a seven-year-old seven meet record in the 5,000-meter run on the first day, while Orlandez Gamble claimed top honors in the high jump. On the women's side, Reagan Evans and Lillian Marino took all-conference honors in the weight throw, placing second and third. Yesterday, Cole Thomas placed first with a personal best in the pole vault helping the men's team to second place overall. Quintero Harrison plays first in the 60-meter hurdles, and with some other podium visits, the women's team came in third overall at the meet. Chepskirt won the 3,000-meter run yesterday and was named Conference Carolina's Men's Track, Af Track Athlete of the Year. The Braves baseball team had a weekend showdown against Southern Wesleyan University. On Friday, the Braves put together a pair of runs in the bottom of the third inning to take the lead. The Braves went, Braves went on a 13-0 run in the bottom of the eight and ran away with a 19-2 victory. In Saturday's doubleheader, the Braves got seven walks and took a bean ball in game one and took advantage of three stolen bases, holding the Warriors to just one run in the 8-1 victory. They finished the series sweep by striking out the Warriors 19 times in game two, coming away with the win, 8-4. After the series sweep, Coach Paul O'Neill emphasized the pitcher. You know, I think our pitching staff has got to be a strength. We've got to get some guys going, you know, that have quality arms, that have maybe, you know, haven't had the best outings so far this year. and They've been a little bit snake bitten. They've, you know, we've got to get their confidence back. And so we've got to get them back out there and get them, you know, back in the fire, so to speak, and, and get them rolling. So, you know, the guys who threw this weekend, I thought, did a really good job. The Braves are on the road this week and face conference opponent in Erskine in South Carolina. Softball was at the Noron, and unfortunately, it was a setback for the Braves, who were coming off a three-game win streak. 
the Bears put together a pair of runs in the second and third inning of the first game, leading them to a 4-0 victory. Lenore Ron trounced the Braves 8-2 in the second game and are now undefeated at home this year. The Braves are back in action Saturday when they host Aldefa University. Braves senior point guard Tyrell Curry is known for his outstanding basketball performances, but this year he has a little extra fuel to finish his senior year, hopefully with a championship. CNT reporter Tyshawn Carter took notice. Today's student profile, we're going to focus on senior guard Tyrell Kirk. Tyrell Kirk is coming off a family tragedy, losing his mother, and is dedicating his senior season to her. There's a person I play for, my mom, that um, passed uh, in March, not too long ago, but uh, last year. But yeah, I played for her. Um, she, was, she was there through thick and thin, through my recruitment through everything, throughout high school, AAU, whatever, she was there. And um, she encouraged me each year, even ups and downs, the good, the bad. And um, yeah, so I do it for her. She She's very proud of me, so I'm gonna make her proud. Kirk is averaging 14 points per game and four rebounds and three assists this season, leading his team to the number nine team in the nation. Last week, he was announced the most winningest player in school history. Coach Drew spoke about Tyrell's success in his career. He's playing really well. Um, you know, Tyrell is every year he's been at UNCP has gotten better in some form or facet, whether it's strength, whether it's um, shot consistency, um, playmaking, and uh, you know, but a big area he's improved a bunch in his leadership. Um, he's been as good of a leader as we've had, and and you know, he, coming from as quiet as he was his first couple of years to to maturing into a guy that's confident enough to be able to communicate to his team and and get his team going whenever they need it, or um, you know, give someone words of encouragement or or challenge somebody. He's been able to fill that role um, really well this year. <laughs> The ninth rates men's basketball team was on the road at Erskine over the weekend. They tallied their 10th straight row win, shooting better than 50% on field goal attempts. In the second half of the game, the Braves went on a 14-2 run, pushing their lead to 21 points with still 14 minutes left to play. Senior Spencer Levi tallied 18 points on 6 of 9 shooting, while also logging 8 rebounds and a pair of blocks. The Braves will have their regular season finale at home against North Greenville Thursday for senior night. Women's basketball continued their streak at Erskine as well. The Braves picked up 21 points from their bench and had three players register double figures. The Braves opened the second half of the game on a 10-2 scoring run and pushed their lead out to 40 points against the Flying Fleets, 28. Courtney Smith scored a game-high 15 points on 5-4-11 five, on five shooting. Like the men's, the women are away tonight at Barton College and on Saturday for senior night. The swimming team was in Kingsport, Tennessee over the weekend for Conference Carolina's championship. Natalia Sevilla registered a conference record on the way to capturing the event title in the 1,650-yard freestyle. Morel Messina Martinez finished second in the 100-yard freestyle, earning a spot on the podium. Senior Jillian Manning shared Conference Carolina Swimmers of the Year laurels with a swimmer from Barton College. The Braves 400-yard Melody Relay team took gold with a time of 3 minutes and 30 seconds. With multiple visits to the medal podium, the Braves placed third overall at the event, their first year in Conference Carolinas. It was a busy weekend for the Braves athletics, and it just doesn't let up. The golf team is competing in the Battle of Hilton Head this weekend, and UNCP plays host to NCAA Wrestling Southeast Regional Tournament this coming Saturday in the Jones Center. I'll let you know how that goes, and I'm out of here, and see you next week. Thanks, Deshaun. That's all we have for you today. We'll see you next week. I'm Jay Locklear. And I'm Jayla Coley. Thanks for watching.